Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Charles. This week we're going to start with another two-part tale, and it's a story of love and deception and deceit, but it really ends up rather well. In fact, it ends up much better than the true historical tale that it is said to be based off of, the story of Marie of Brabant, wife of Louis II, Duke of Bavaria, and Count Palatine of the Rhine. That story, although much more historically truthful, is also much sadder. And this story also goes to show us just how pervasive and, well, historical Islamophobia is. So many unflattering pictures of Islam in this tale. This is part one of Geneva. In all the Rhine provinces, the virtuous spouse of Count Siegfried of the Palatinate was esteemed and venerated. The people called her Saint Geneva, which name indeed she was worthy of as she suffered cruel trials and sorrows. Siegfried's castle stood near the old town of Andernach, just at the time when Charles Martel was reigning over the Franks. Siegfried and his young wife lived in peaceful unity till a cloud came over their happiness. The much-dreaded Arabs from Spain had forced their way into Gaul and were now marching northwards, burning and destroying all on their course. The enemies of the cross must be repulsed unless the West was to share the fate of Africa, which had been subdued by the Mahometans. The war cry reached the Palatinate, and Siegfried had to go forth to the fight. Equipped in his armor, and having kissed his weeping wife, he bade farewell to the castle of his fathers. But he was sad at heart at leaving the spot where the happiest days of his life had been spent. He entrusted the administration of his property to Golo, his steward, and recommended his beloved wife very earnestly to his protection, begging her in turn to trust him in everything. The poor countess was heartbroken at this bitter separation. She felt the loneliness of the castle deeply, and longed for his happy presence and the sound of his voice. She could never speak to Golo as to the friend to whose care her husband had recommended her. Her pure eyes shrank from the passionate look which gleamed in his. It seemed to her that he followed her every movement with a look which her childlike soul did not understand. She missed her husband's presence more and more. She would go out on the balcony and weave golden dreams, and while she sat there, looking out over the hazy blue distance, she longed for the moment when Siegfried would return, when he could lean her head upon his breast, and tell him of the great happiness in store for them. Perhaps the war against the heathens might last so long that she would be able to hold the pledge of their love joyfully out to him from the balcony on his return and the countess's lovely face would be lit up with a gleam of blissful happiness, and she would a while away the time on her favorite spot, dreaming and looking out into the hazy blue distance. The secret aversion which the countess felt toward the steward was not without a reason. Her angel-like beauty had awakened lustful passion in Golo's breast, which he did not strive to hide. On the contrary, His frequent intercourse with her, who was as gracious to him as to all other inferiors, stirred his passion still more, and one day, losing all control, he threw himself at the countess's feet, declaring his love for her and imploring her to return it. Geneva was horrified at this confession. With indignation and scorn she rejected his love, forbidding him to appear before her as he had utterly forgotten his duty, and at the same time, threatening to complain of him to her husband. Golo's eyes flared up, and a deadly look of hatred gleamed from them. He could hope for no pardon from his angry mistress. Besides, his pride would not allow him to seek it, and now his one desire was revenge. It only remained for him to follow his dastardly plan and to avoid Siegfried's wrath. Hatred raged in his breast. 
He dismissed all the servants of the castle and put new ones of his own creation in their places. Then one day, he appeared before the horrified countess and openly accused her of being unfaithful to her husband far away. Shame and wrath robbed Geneva of speech. Golo explained to the servants who were standing around in silent amazement that he had already informed the count of his wife's faithless conduct, and that he, Golo, as present administrator of the castle, now condemned the countess to be imprisoned in the dungeon. The unhappy Geneva awakened to find herself in an underground cell of the castle. She covered her face in deep sorrow, imploring him who had sent her this trial to help her in her present affliction. There, after some time, a son was born to her. She baptized him with her tears, giving him the name of Tristan, which means full of sorrows. Siegfried had already been absent six months. He had fought like a hero in many a desperate battle. The fanatical followers of Mohammed, having crossed the Pyrenees, struggled with wild enthusiasm, hoping to subdue the rest of Western Europe to the doctrines of Islam by sword and fire. In several encounters, the Franks had been obliged to give way to their power. These unbridled hordes had already penetrated into the heart of Gaul, when Charles first appeared and engaged the Arabs in the bloody Battle of Tours. From morning till evening the struggle on which hung the fate of Europe raged, and there Charles proved himself worthy of the name Martel, the Hammer, which he afterwards received. Siegfried fought at the leader's side like a lion, but towards evening a saccharine's lance pierced him, and though the wound was not mortal, yet he was obliged to remain inactive for several months on a sickbed where he thought with longing in his heart of his loving wife by the Rhine. A messenger arrived one day at the camp bearing a parchment from Golo, Siegfried's steward. The Count gazed long at the fateful letter, trying to comprehend its meaning. What he had read ran thus, Your wife is unfaithful to you and has betrayed you for the sake of Drago, a servant who ran away. The hero crushed the letter furiously in his hand, a groan escaping from his white lips. Then he started off, accompanied by a few followers, and rode towards Ardennes, never stopping till he reached his own fort. A man stood on the balcony, looking searchingly out into the distance, and seeing a cloud of dust approaching in which a group of horsemen soon became visible, his eyes gleamed triumphantly. A stately knight advanced, his charger stamping threateningly on the drawbridge. Golo, with hypocritical emotions, stood before the count who had now alighted from his foaming horse and informed him again of what had happened. Where is the evildoer who has stained the honor of my house? Where is he, that I might crush his life out? cried Siegfried in a fury. My lord, I have punished the wretch deservedly and lashed him out of the castle answered Golo in a stern voice, sighing deeply. The Count made a sign to Golo, whose false eyes gleamed with devilish joy, to lead the way. Siegfried entered the dungeon, followed by his servants, and also by those who had travelled with him. Geneva listened breathlessly in her prison, with a loved name trembling on her lips and a prayer to God in her heart. Now, The terrible trial would come to an end. Now she would leave this dungeon of disgrace triumphantly and exchange the crown of thorns for the victor's wreath. The bolt was unfastened. Firm steps and men's voices were heard. The iron doors were dashed open. She snatched her slumbering child, the pledge of their love, and held it towards her dear husband. His name was on her lips, but before she could utter it, a cry of agony escaped her. He had cast her from him, and, his accusations falling like blows from a hammer on her head, the poor innocent countess fell senseless to the ground. The next day, two servants led mother and child out into the forest, where, with their own hands, they were to kill her who had been so unfaithful to her husband, and the child also. They were to bring back two tongues to the count as a proof that they had obeyed his orders. The servants drove them into the wildest depths of the forest where only the screams of birds of prey broke the silence. 
they drew their knives. But the poor countess fell on her knees, and holding up her little child implored them to spare their lives, if not for her sake, at least for the sake of the helpless child. Pity entered the two men's hearts and withheld their hands. Dragging the mother and child still deeper into the forest, they turned away hastily, leaving their victims to themselves. They brought two hearts' tongues to the count, informing him that they had fulfilled his orders. And that is the first part of Geneva, a story of love and deceit, but not the deceit that you expect or you think. It's the deceit of Golo that is really the crime here. And like I said, this story is based on one, the story of Marie of Brabant, wife of Louis II, Duke of Bavaria. That story, however, as I started off saying, is much sadder because, well, Louis had his wife beheaded. There was nothing coming back from that. This story, at least, our heroine, well, she's abandoned in the woods, but she does still have her head, which is much better than the original story. This is Dan Scholes from the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you'd like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>